Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today with another part of The Vanderbeekers of 141st Street. This book is by Karina Jan Glaser, and it is uh, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. We're gonna pick up right where we left off, which is at the beginning of Saturday, December 21st, with chapter five. The radiator woke Hyacinth the next day, whistling a joyful good morning. Instead of feeling cheered by it like she usually did, Hyacinth felt as if a sewing needle was poking her around in her stomach. It was Saturday, the official start to Operation Biederman. Through her window, she could see the last wrinkled leaves gripping to the branches of the ancient red maple, refusing to drift down to the ground until absolutely necessary. Hyson could tell Lainey was still in a deep sleep without even looking at her. Lainey made a funny whistling sound when she slept. Hyson climbed down from her bunk, shoved her feet into her bare slippers, and tugged on her favorite fuzzy sweatshirt, which she had stolen from Oliver. She stepped over a snoozing Franz and crept out the door, careful to turn the doorknob in a special way to keep it from squeaking. Despite being the second to last in the Vanderbeeker family line, Hyacinth often felt that she was the true middle child. Of course, Oliver had learned that had earned that right by being born between two sets of sisters, but he had the honor of being the only boy, which held him apart. The twins were exactly the same age, so in Hyacinth's mind, they kind of counted as one. And if you didn't include Oliver, because he was the boy that left Hyacinth taking the true middle spot, fending for herself in a household of loud, strong-willed, attention-grabbing siblings. To get her fair share of time with her parents, Hyacinth had developed a habit of getting up early. She tiptoed downstairs. Her dad was sitting on the couch, cradling his mug of steaming coffee, a thick book open before him. Paganini was hopping in bizarre patterns around the living room carpet, periodically flinging himself into the air and spinning as if auditioning for a Broadway show. George Washington lay sprawled on his back, lazily swatting at the bunny as he zipped past. Hyacinth stepped around the animals and snuggled in next to her dad. He slipped his arm around her, drawing her in close. He smelled like coffee and peppermint drops. Papa, why does the Biederman hate us so much? Hyacinth asked. Papa kissed the top of Hyacinth's head. Hate is such a strong word. I definitely don't think he hates you. I think he's unhappy, which has nothing to do with you kids. Hyson thought about the Biederman mission that they had planned for that morning and was glad that they were going to do something so nice for him. Then she felt ashamed that she was too afraid to do the first mission, even though all of her siblings wanted her to. Papa, asked Hyacinth. Yes? How can I get more brave? Hyson squeezed her eyes shut and curled in nearer to Papa. She was afraid that he would tell her that she would never be brave. Why, Hyson, you're one of the bravest people I know, Papa said. Really? asked Hyacinth, her eyes popping open. Really, said Papa. It takes a super brave person to be as generous as you are. Not many people are brave enough to be so loving. Hyacinth thought about this while she watched Paganini nibble on a stack of books and George Washington groom his ears. Papa smiled at the animals. Until one has loved an animal, part of one's soul remains unawakened. Hyacinth looked up at her father. What does that mean, Papa? It means that animals make our hearts happy in a very special way. A French ma man named Anatole France said that a long time ago. The sound of a door opening and then another one marked the end of Papa and Hyacinth's morning alone time. A faucet turned on in the upstairs bathroom and they heard water whoosh through the pipes within the brownstone walls. A big thunk followed, which was most likely Oliver jumping off the last few rungs of his loft bed. Soft footsteps padded down the upstairs hallway and paused at the top of the stairs. Lainey was awake. She descended one stair at a time, the stairs creaking happily. When she got to the bottom, she speed walked to Papa, climbed in his lap, and nuzzled in close. And there they sat for a precious few moments, Papa and his two youngest children, while the rest of the family awoke and the sounds of the city began to crescendo all around them. Ten minutes later, the Vanderbeeker apartment buzzed with kids and parents going in and out of bedrooms and bathrooms and up and down the stairs. When Izzy came downstairs, she saw Oliver, his hair rumpled on one side, sitting slouched on a stool by the kitchen island, staring at an open book. 
She pulled out the stool across from him and sat down. Do you really think that we can win the Biedermann over in four days? She asked as she gathered her hair back and braided it into a long plait. Oliver spoke without looking away from his book. Sure, and why don't we solve America's budget crisis and save the orcas while we're at it? Isa paused. So that's a no? Honestly, Oliver said, I have no idea. I think your idea was brilliant. Really? Oliver perked up a bit. Oh yeah, Isa replied. I have a good feeling about it. Then you should hear my other idea, said Oliver, closing his book. I think we should use a combination of Lainey, Hyacinth, and Jesse. First, Jesse can pick the lock to Biederman's door. Next, Hyacinth can torture him with her sewing needles. Then Lainey can suffocate him with kisses and hugs until he... Let's just hope the first idea works and he realizes how wonderful we are and begs us to say, as they interrupted him. Oliver grinned. Too bad you're too nice. I could probably think of a way to get you in on the plan, too. While Oliver and Isa discussed the Biederman mission, Hyacinth came downstairs with an armload of felt. She settled down on the living room carpet and busied herself cutting red felt circles for her hollyberry placemats. Franz looked on with his woeful basset hound eyes and then went to his food bowl and began the slow process of nudging it across the room until it banged into her knee. Hyacinth recognizing the gravity of the situation, immediately stood up. Oh, my poor Franz, you must be starving. Fr Franz looked at Hyacinth and forgave her at once. Hyacinth filled his bowl with precisely one scoop of dry dog food. The veterinarian had warned her against Fr giving Franz more than that for fear he would get too heavy. Oliver, who had been beside her at the appointment, muttered too late under his breath, just loud enough for Hyacinth to hear. It was a particular gift of Oliver's that he could say things that adults couldn't hear, but his sisters could. Hyacinth was feeding Franz when a disheveled Jessie came downstairs with her signature bedhead, followed by Lainey wearing a glittery crown. We're off, Jessie announced to Isa, Oliver, and Hyacinth as she wrangled Lainey into her puffy purple jacket and sparkly winter boots. Make sure to buy extra cheese croissants, Oliver said. Good idea, Jessie said. She grabbed a ragged scarf and wrapped it around her neck. All the better to persuade the Biederman with. The extra cheese croissants were for me, Oliver clarified, but I guess you can get some for the Biederman too. Jessa and Izzy, uh, <laughs> Izza and Jessie shared an eye roll, and then Jessie took Lainey's hand and led her outside, where they promptly bumped into Mr. Smiley, the superintendent at the big apartment building on their block, and his daughter Angie, who was friends with Oliver. Hello, lady. Hello, Jessie. Mr. Smiley said. Tell Oliver that he owes me a baseball game, Angie said. Oliver and Angie were constantly challenging each other to one-on-one -on -one basketball games, and it had to be said that Angie was so good that the boys' basketball team had begged for her to play for them. Jesse and Lainey waved goodbye. They passed by the brownstone with the turrets, then the brownstone covered with ivy, then the brownstone where garlands of pine were draped along the windows, and a huge wreath with a wavy burgundy bow decorated the heavy wooden door. I turned the corner onto the boulevard, where the quiet of their street gave way to the city buses with their screeching brakes, and shop owners unlocking and rolling up the metal grates that had been pulled down over their stores the night before. A garbage truck squealed to a stop down the street, and Mark, one of their neighborhood sanitation men, jumped off the back and tossed the contents of an overflowing trash bin into the hopper of the garbage truck. You're strong, Lainey called. I'm going to be strong one day, too. Lainey pumped her arms to show her bicep. Mark laughed and said, hey, I got a good joke for you, Lainey. What's red and white and red and white and red and white? Lainey tilted her head, considering. A candy cane? That's one answer, but I'm thinking of something else. Mark said, grabbing hold of the end of the garbage truck once again. The truck began to move. Tell me, yelled Lainey at the retreating truck. Mark bellowed the answer. Santa Claus rolling down a hill. Lainey giggled and waved as Mark saluted her from the back of the garbage truck. Down the avenue they went. They passed by Harlem Coffee with their long line of bleary-eyed customers. A to Z Deli, which was just now opening. Then the library, still closed for another few hours. Once they passed the library, the sisters made a right at 137th Street. They smelled the delicious buttery sweet bread smells from Castleman's Bakery before they saw the storefront. Castleman's Bakery, home of the legendary cheese croissants, was right across from the entrance to City College. 
It had sat in that same location for decades and had a loyal following of people who would cross boroughs and state lines to buy bread and pastries there. The Vanderbeeker kids truly believed that the Biedermann would take one bite of the buttery but not greasy, flaky but not crumbly pastry and be won over at once. Mr. Castleman was their renowned neighborhood baker and his wife managed the front of the store. They had a son, Benny, an eighth grader in the Twins Middle School and a close friend of Isa's. He worked as a cashier at the bakery on the week weekends and some days after school. At his suggestion, his parents had recently purchased an electronic touchscreen register that had all the prices programmed in, along with a credit card machine, allowing customers to sign their name with their finger. Benny, however, was the only one who knew how to operate this register. Mrs. Castleman preferred to use the antique cash register that made a brisk ka sound whenever the drawer was opened. Hey, hey, what's up, Vanderbeekers? Benny called from behind the register with a wide grin. He wore a football jersey and blue jeans under his work apron. Jessie smiled at him, and Lainey ducked under the counter and wrapped her arms around his waist. Hello, Princess Lainey, Benny said as Lainey adjusted the crown on her head. I have a joke for you, Lainey said. Tell me. Okay, what is Santa Claus rolling down a hill? Wait, that's not it. I forgot. Lainey's eyebrows were furred with confusion. What's red and white and... Jessie prompted... Oh, yeah. What's red and white and red and white and red and white? Benny tapped his chin with his index finger. Hmm, that's a tough one. Hmm. Lainey was gleeful. Do you give up? Should I tell you? Tell me, I can't think of anything. Santa Claus rolling down a hill. Benny chuckled. Oh, man, that is a good joke. I'm going to remember that one. Benny picked Lainey up and sat her on the counter next to the register and then plucked a jam cookie from a wide mouth glass jar and handed it to her. Then he reached in again and retrieved one for Jessie, presenting it to her with a gallant bow. Thanks, Benny, Jessie said, taking a bite of the crumbly cookie. She had known him for so long that she forgot to call him Benjamin, the name he decided that he wanted to be called the day that he turned 10. Mrs. Castleman peered through round tortoiseshell spectacles over the glass case containing the breads and pastries, her gaze just barely skimming the top. The usual, yes? She asked. Jesse nodded. Also, I need three of your best breakfast goodies for our upstairs neighbor. How are Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet doing? Asked Mrs. Castleman. Oh, they're doing fine, but the pastries aren't for them. This time it's for our upstairs, upstairs neighbor, Mr. Biederman. Mrs. Castleman raised an eyebrow in surprise. Mr. Biederman? He lives on the third floor. We're trying to persuade him to like us. Jessie rummaged through her bag for her wallet. Mr. Biederman? Mrs. Castleman uh, repeated softly while she leaned down to pluck pastries from the display case. Something in the way that Mrs. Castleman said his name made Jessie stop. She bent down to peer through the glass case, but she could only see Mrs. Castleman's hand reaching out to retrieve the pastries. Do you know him, Mrs. Castleman? A pause. Jessie was about to ask again, louder, when Benny interrupted. So, Jessie, did you hear about the eighth grade dance? He asked casually, leaning his elbow on the counter. Lainey still sat next to the register, picking through the coins in a little cup that said, Take a penny, leave a penny. Jessie glanced at Mrs. Castleman one more time before turning back to Benny. No, what is it, is it, what is it about? Jessie said to Benny as she dug through her tote. Battered science notebook, a couple of pieces of candy, and a tired, uh, in tired wrappers, scuffed calculator. Oh, there was her wallet. Well, Benny continued, do you think that your sister would want to go? Jessie lifted her eyes to his. What sister? Then he stuck his hands deep down in the pocket of his jeans. Isa, your twin sister. Isa, go to an eighth grade dance? Benny, she's a seventh grader. She can't go to an eighth grade dance. She can go with an eighth grader, which I am, an eighth grader, and I would ask her nicely, of course. Do you think that she would say yes? Benny began to shift from foot to foot. Lainey interrupted. I like to dance, she informed him while handing him two pennies from the take a penny cup. Benny took the pennies from her and dropped them back into the cup. Meanwhile, Jessie's mind spun like the centrifuge that she'd used in science class last month. Benny wanted to take her sister to a dance without her? They had never gone to a school dance without each other. They had never gone to a dance with a date, ever. That would surely violate the rule of the twins. 
Somewhere in that unwritten contract, there must be a clause that clearly stated that neither was to attend a dance without the other, especially with a date. I am positive she wouldn't want to go with you, Benny. I'm sorry, Jesse said. Not that you aren't great. It's just that I definitely think no. Jesse started to feel a little bad for him as Benny's face fell. Why not? It's nothing against you. I just can't imagine her saying yes. She opened her wallet and pulled out some money. I like to dance, Lainey repeated as she took another penny from the cup and tried to scrub it clean with the hem of her jacket. Benny didn't respond to either sister. He carefully rang up Jessie's order on the cash register, took her money, and then handed her the change. Thanks, Benny, said Jessie, grabbing the bags of croissants and the goodies for Mr. Biederman. Benny lifted Lainey down from the counter, and she ducked back under and took Jessie's hand. See you around, Jessie said with a brief wave. Bye, Mrs. Castleman. The two sisters left the bakery while Benny and his mother watched them disappear from view. Mrs. Castleman wisely stepped into the back room where her husband was twisting and kneading bread, leaving her son alone with his thoughts. Chapter six. The moment Jessie left the bakery, all thoughts of dances and Benny and the rule of the twins vanished. Lainey, who carried the Beeserman's bag of po pastries, surreptitiously peeked into the brown sugar bag, the brown bag while they were walking home. The sugary, spicy smell of the apple turnover almost made her dizzy. She wondered if the Beezerman would mind if she took one for herself. Don't even think about it, Jessie said, reaching down to cup Lainey's chin. Lainey puffed out her cheeks and rolled the top of the bag closed. Isa, Hyacinth, and Oliver were waiting in the kitchen when Jessie and Lainey returned. Quick, we sent Mama and Papa upstairs and told them that we would bring them breakfast in bed. They looked so pre pleased they didn't even ask any questions, said Isa, her face flushed. Hyacinth had taken out her special tea tray and tea things to use for the Biederman's breakfast. The tray was faded but still pretty, with a big rainbow in the middle and three cherubs with harps floating above it. Her china teapot only had two chips, and she had folded a piece of red checker fabric for a napkin and laid it on the side of the tray. The kids transferred the remains from the morning's coffee pot into the teapot, and then Oliver dumped three generous spoonfuls of sugar into it, and Isa added the milk. After Jessie stirred it, Isa placed it on the teapot. Isa placed the teapot on the tray, and Hyacinth artfully arranged the pastries from Lainey's bag. To their knowledge, the Biederman had never experienced the joy of breakfast in bed, and they were certain that Oliver's excellent idea would win him over. Ready? Jessie asked Lainey. Ready, ready, Lainey chirped. The Vanderbeekers went upstairs, crept past Mama and Papa's bedroom, and then opened the door that led to the first floor hallway. Be careful, Isa whispered. Break a leg, Oliver whispered. Hyacinth didn't say anything. She just bit her lip and looked worried. They watched as Jessie and Lainey went up the stairs. The scent of laundry soap, old books, and double chocolate pecan cookies from the Vanderbeeker's floor gave way to the smell of Miss Josie's Southern Rose perfume on the second floor. The stairs leading up to the third floor groaned all the way up, and the air turned musty and stale as if the brownstone were warning them away. Jessie took a deep breath and prepared to knock. Before she could exhale, Lainey pounded her two fists on the door. Lainey! Jessie tried to balance the tray while preventing Lainey from attacking the door again. The teapot shivered and slid to the edge of the tray. Jessie lifted up a knee to prop up the tray, but overcompensated. Fudge, Jessie blurched out, blurted out as the teapot slid to the other side of the tray, tipped off the side and shattered on the ground. The three pastries fell on top of it. Fudge, fudge, fudge. The people with a collection, uh, uh, Jessie cast a look at the door. The pupil was a collection of circles getting smaller and smaller, converging on a dark round circle in the middle. Then the circle blinked. Oh, fudge! This time Jessie's, uh, Jessie's word was a, quite a bit louder. She scooped Lainey up and crashed down the stairs. The destroyed breakfast left abandoned outside the Biederman's door. Isa, Hyacinth, and Oliver were waiting by the first floor doorway when they heard Jessie's yelling followed by a terrific crash. Seconds later, they saw Jessie and Lainey barreling down the stairs. When Isa saw the terror on Jessie's face, she did not stop to ask questions. Isa swung open the door to their apartment, and together the five Vanderbeekers scrambled inside and let the door slam behind them. Complete fail, Jessie wheezed, her back against the hallway wall. Shh, Isa said, pointing a figure at Mama and Papa's room. 
The kids tiptoed to Izza in Jessie's room and shut the door. What happened? asked Izza, the woman with the door closed. Jessie was frantic. I lost control of the tray and everything fell. I'm sorry, Hyacinth, I broke your teapot. Hyacinth looked back at Jesse with wide eyes. After I dropped the breakfast, I looked at the door and I saw his evil eye blinking, blink at me through the people and it was like he was cursing me with a thousand curses. I didn't think I should have stayed up there and cleaned up or tried to explain to him or something. I'm sorry, I screwed up. Jesse babbled. Okay, okay, it's okay. I'll clean it up, don't worry, Isa said, pulling Jesse into a hug. I'll help, Hyacinth said. Me too, Oliver offered. Lanny was put in charge of soothing Jessie's wounded soul by feeding her cheese croissants while Isa, Hyacinth, and Oliver grabbed cleaning supplies and a garbage bag and went upstairs. Tears dripped from Hyacinth's eyes as she gathered the remains of her beloved teapot and put them in the garbage bag. Oliver mopped up the spill with paper towels and mourned the ruined soggy pastries. Isa did a final mop to get rid of the stickiness, careful to keep her eyes averted from the peephole. They slinked down the stairs, each one thinking that this was a huge setback to Operation Biederman. While Isa, Oliver, and Hyacinth were cleaning up, Jesse and Lainey delivered croissants to their parents. Lainey went over to Papa's side of the bed and snuggled next to him as he scrolled through his phone reviewing job tickets, which Lainey knew meant all the computer problems that people wanted Papa to fix, like when someone spelled coffee on their keyboard or when the key computer showed only a black screen no matter how many buttons you pushed. Mama looked up from her own phone when Jessie stood by her bed. Mama had been cl clicking through a realtor website. Everything okay, Mama asked, setting her phone down on the bedside table. Jessie shrugged and handed over the bag of croissants. Talk to me, her mom said, beckoning Jessie to sit on the bed. Jessie perched on the side. This whole moving thing sucks big time. Mama nodded and wrapped an arm around her. This whole place has so many memories. Mama looked at the wall where six years ago an unsupervised three-year-old Oliver had drawn a post-impressionistic Picasso-like depiction of their family. The miraculous thing was about the artwork is that Oliver had drawn not just himself, but Jessie, Jessie with her signature wild science hair, Isa with her typical smooth ponytail, and his parents, but also yet to be born Hyacinth and Lainey. I feel like we need to cut out the part of the wall and bring it with us to our new home, Mama said. Uncle Arthur could do it, Jesse suggested. I don't think the Biederman, I mean Mr. Biederman, would appreciate us gouging a hole in his wall. Mama continued to look at the drawing. Then, to Jesse's horror, she saw a tear roll down Mama's face. Oh, Mama, don't cry, Jesse said, even as she felt the burning of her own eyes. Sweetie, don't worry about me. Mama brushed a tear away and gave Jessie a brave smile. I'm just being sentimental. Jessie's throat constricted. She wanted to rewind the last hour and do it all over again. In her mind, she saw herself handing the tray with elegance and poise, presenting it to a grateful Biederman who accepted it with a smile. He would be so relieved to have real food after all those years of frozen dinners. With his first bite of cheese croissant, his eyes would light up and he would announce that the Vanderbeekers could stay in their apartment forever. If only the reimagined sto story could be reality. Chapter 7 The mood was somber by the time the five Vanderbeeker kids gathered back downstairs to eat their own breakfast. Hyacinth felt responsible for the failed outreach as she watched Jesse mope. After all, Jesse had wanted Hyacinth to do the first Biederman mission. Now, Hyacinth needed to fix it. Directly after breakfast, Hyacinth retreated to her room with Franz. While her dog occupied himself by staring out the window at a bird, Hyacinth took out her sewing supplies and sheets of red and green felt. Carefully, she cut out the letters spelling the Biederman's name from the green felt, and then she threaded her needle and sewed the letters into the rectangular red piece. The letters did not end up going across the placement in a straight line. Instead, four letters in, she realized that there was a distinct upward slant. She tried to correct it with the next few letters, but when she reached M, the name was tilting in the opposite direction. By the time she finished, the name had a decidedly bumpy look about it, and something else seemed off. She thought that the I was before the E, but after she sewed the letters on, it looked a little wrong. Hyacinth's hand was aching by the time she finished. She rolled the placemat up, up and tied a green velvet ribbon around it. 
She let her eyes linger on the green ribbon, already mourning the loss of that piece from her collection. It was not easy to part with her beautiful things. <sighs> you ready to be brave, Franz? asked Hyacinth. Franz lifted his front legs and rested them against her stomach. It was time for Hyacinth to be more than just the fourth Vanderbeeker, the shy one, the scare one. She needed to be Hyacinth the Brave, a girl on a mission to save her home. Together, Hyacinth the Brave and Franz left their apartment and marched upstairs. The brown stone stairs whimpered all the way. Be brave, be brave, be brave, Hyacinth whispered to herself. She looked down at Franz and her faithful dog grinned at her, wagging his tail. Hyacinth squared her shoulders and knocked on the door. The second Hyacinth knocked, she knew something bad was going to happen. She knew before she heard the stomping from the inside the third floor apartment and the barrage of clicks and bangs from the locks being disengaged. She knew even before the door swung open. Hyacinth trembled as she stood before a monster of a man with shaggy dark hair and a beard streaked with white. His face was creased and pale and lifeless. He was wearing black, black, black. Leave me alone. His voice shocked Hyacinth. It sounded like he was talking around a mouthful of nails. Move out of here and let me be. Hyacinth stood frozen for a full second. No longer was she Hyacinth the Brave. She was back to being the fourth Vanderbeeker, first class warrior, and the shyest kid on 141st Street. She dropped the placemat at his feet and stumbled down the stairs, Franz at her heels. She reached to the door to their apartment and slammed the door behind her. When she reached the safety of her top bunk, she burst into tears, big, hiccuping, drowning tears. Oliver's stomach was rumbling when he heard the door from down the hall, down the hall from his bedroom slam and then his little sister's bedroom door open and shut. For a millisecond, he wondered if everything was okay. When he didn't hear anything else, he put his book aside and decided to search the kitchen to see if he could find where his mom was hiding the double chocolate pecan cookies. He opened his bedroom door. Oliver heard sobbing. It sounded like Hyacinth. He tried to ignore it. The cookies were calling him, but then the sobbing intensified. Oliver knocked on Hyacinth and Lainey's bedroom door. There was no answer. He opened the door and he peeked inside. Fran sat on the carpet, whimpering. Hyacinth lay on her top bunk, her stuffed penguin held close to her chest. Oliver let himself in and closed the door behind him. Can I come up? There was no answer except for suppressed sobs, so Oliver took that as a yes and climbed to the top bunk. Hyacinth was a sad sight with her blotchy face and swollen eyes. Everything okay? Oliver asked. No answer. He tried again. Want to tell me what's wrong? Nothing. Do I need to get my sword and take someone down? Hyacinth sobbed out something through her tears that sounded like Miss BB Mania, which Oliver was certain could not be correct. He gingerly patted Hyacinth's back and waited her for her to be a bit more coherent. I felt like I needed to fix <laughs> what happened this morning with breakfast. Well, I spent hours making him a policeman and then I brought it upstairs to him and I thought I was Hyacinth the Brave, but <laughs> he was the scariest man I've ever seen. Hyacinth's eyes brimmed with fresh tears. Oliver scowled, then rolled his shoulders and neck. I'm going to challenge him to a pirate duel. Oliver demonstrated his hand swipe technique. Take that, Beaterbin. Hyacinth looked at Oliver with watery eyes. After I defeat him with my superior pirate skills, we could let Franz loose and have him pee all over his door again. Would that make you feel better? Franz's tail thumped once against the carpet. I don't know why he hates us so much, Hyacinth said with a wail. Oliver deflated. Maybe it's best that we move. At least we'll get away from him. Hyacinth shook her head sadly. I love it here. I want things to go back to how they were before, before we had to be nice to him. Her eyes began to well up. Oliver, alarmed by the prospect of Hyacinth crying again, suggested that she could she should, that they should go downstairs so that she could show him her collection of buttons. It was an activity that never failed to cheer her up, even though it bored Oliver to no end. As they went down the stairs to the living room, Oliver remembered something. Hey, Hyacinth? Yeah? What did the Biederman look like anyway? 
Hyacinth paused to think. Do you remember the movie that all Uncle all Uncle Arthur took us to last year? The one where the werewolf creeps out of the cave to attack the unicorn? Yeah. The Biederman looked like the werewolf. Wow, Oliver said as he let out the breath that he didn't know he was holding. Cool. While Oliver was trying to make Hyacinth feel better, Lainey received permission from Mama to bring Paganini the bunny upstairs to Miss Josie and Mr. Jeet's place. Lainey loved visiting them for many reasons. One, Miss Josie made the best jam cookies with plenty of strawberry jam in the middle, and she never, ever used orange marmalade. Two, Mr. Jeet always knew what she was saying. He didn't do that awful grown-up thing where he looked at her parents or siblings to translate what she said. Three, Miss Josie was a terrific dancer, and she was teaching Lainey how to lindy hop. Four, going into their apartment was like entering an enchanted garden, and Miss Josie let Lainey pick flowers anytime she wanted. Mama and Papa had told Lainey that Mr. G had a stroke two years ago, which meant that he sounded and looked a little different than he used to. But that never bothered Lainey. He'd always been the same to her, and she loved the way that he talked, nice and slow, so that she could understand all the words. Isa and Jesse and Oliver told stories about how Mr. G used to give them endless piggyback rides. He would play horsey and sleeping bear and friendly dragon. Lainey didn't remember that, but it didn't matter. Mr. G was perfect in every way. Lainey lured Paganini into his carrier with a few bits of carrot and then took her time climbing to the second floor. A few months earlier, she had stumbled going up the stairs and almost fell on Paganini and squashed him, and Lainey did not want that to happen. So she made it upstairs without tripping, set the carrier down, and attempted many unsuccessful jumps to reach the doorbell. By her fifth jump, the door swung open and a smiling Miss Josie appeared. Miss Josie had curlers in her hair and fuzzy slippers on her feet. She greeted Lainey with a big hug. Hello, my beautiful Lainey. Come in and have some tea and cookies with Mr. G and me. Lainey brushed past the large fern and skipped over to Mr. G and climbed into his lap. Mr. G was immaculately dressed in a pressed button-down shirt and crisp black trousers. A large daisy was stuck into his shirt pocket and a purple bow tie with very thin white stripes lay against his throat. Your bow tie is very nice, Lainey commented, followed by, Does the Biederman like cheese croissants? Cheese croissants? Mr. Jeet repeated as he removed the daisy from his pocket and handed it to Lainey. I don't know. He looked at Miss Josie. Did you ever meet him, pressed Lainey. She took a deep whiff of the daisy before sticking it behind her ear. Miss Josie looked uncomfortable. I knew him back before, uh, well, never mind that. I remember he used to listen to a lot of music. He had a record player like us. He loved jazz music. I like jazz music, said Lainey. Miss Josie leaned down and kissed Lainey's forehead. Me too, she said. Mr. G tugged on one of Lainey's braids. Is Paganini with you? He's here. Lainey slid off Mr. G's lap and got the carrier. She unzipped it, and the tip of Paganini's nose emerged. Miss Josie gave Mr. G a sprig of cilantro, and Paganini's rabbit nose led the way over to the delicious herb, where he plucked it from Mr. G's hands and ate it with both efficiency and speed. Mr. G grinned, his smile lopsided. You should train him, Mr. G said. Do tricks. Lainey giggled. Paganini do tricks? That's so funny, Mr. G. Mr. Jeet looked at her with a serious face. Would be fun. Lainey realized that Mr. Jeet was not joking. She imagined her family looking at her in amazement. Then she added the spotlight and a stage and lots of clapping, clapping to her imagination. Lainey looked at Mr. Jeet with more interest. What kind of tricks? Mr. Jeet pulled out another sprig of cilantro and said, Paganini, come. The bunny was busy rooting around in the corner behind a ficus plant and paid Mr. Jeet no attention. Mr. Jeet gestured to Lainey and she walked across the room and picked up Paganini and turned him around. Mr. Jeet repeated the command, waving the cilantro. Paganini hopped right over at the smell of the cilantro and gobbled it up, his back molars crunching happily. And so the training began. Mr. Jeet instructed Miss Josie to chop a carrot into little bits. They would serve, these would serve as Paganini's training tools. Together, Mr. G and Lainey worked on come, 
recording Paganini with one small piece of carrot every time he successfully completed the command. It was decided that Lanny would visit with Paganini every day for training. Big plans were made for a bunny show after Christmas Eve dinner. Can I wear a sparkly dress? Asked Lanny. And shoes with heels that tap like Mama's shoes? Mr. G nodded. Paganini can wear a bow tie. I'll lend him one. As Lainey put Paganini back in her carrier, she turned around to Miss Josie and Mr. G. Did you know we're moving? She asked. Miss Josie went silent and Mr. G looked away. We know, Miss Josie said finally. Your papa told us. I don't want to move. Will you still live upstairs? Sweetie, I don't think we can move with you, Miss Josie replied. We're too old to make a big move like that. I have an idea. I can help you move. I can carry things downstairs, Lainey suggested. How about we'll see what happens. But if we can't come with you, we'll visit you and you can visit us. Miss Josie wobbled and Mr. Jeet's head bowed lower, tears rolling down his cheeks and splashing onto his pants. Miss Josie walked Lainey and Paganini to the door and watched them descend the staircase to the first floor and safely enter their apartment. Miss Josie closed her own door and then went to her husband and kissed his head. It'll be okay. We'll be okay. She whispered to him, even as her own tears betrayed her. That is where we're going to stop today. And we'll pick up tomorrow with chapter eight. We've been reading The Vanderbeekers of 141st Street, written by Karina Young Glazer, published by Hot and Mifflin Harcourt. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.